Welcome back to another weekly AFC North update after week 15 of the NFL season. Uh, the AFC North standings haven't looked quite like this really all season after it was pretty uniform for a lot of it. There's been a lot of shakeups happening as we get closer and closer to the regular season ending and the playoffs beginning. But one thing that has remained the same, the still division leading Baltimore Ravens still at the front of the pack and now the still AFC leading Baltimore Ravens 3-2 divisional record now an 11-3 overall record. They beat the Jaguars on the road on Sunday Night Football 23-7 and with that win they have punched their ticket to the playoffs. They have guaranteed themselves a spot in the postseason. Uh, they're the first AFC team to get in, as well as the first AFC team to reach 11 wins. So the top seed in the AFC is theirs to lose at this point. Uh, in that game against Jacksonville, first half theme for them was bend it, don't break. After taking a, an early 3-0 lead, the Jaguars offense had a couple of drives get to field goal range, but uh, McManus missing his first two free field goal attempts uh, after a bad Lamar Jackson interception the Jaguars had another drive in scoring range but Trevor Lawrence just kind of uh, dropping the ball as he was scrambling and the Ravens defense recovered Lamar Jackson making up for that interception before halftime as as on that next drive after the fumble recovery he had a touchdown pass to Isaiah likely so 10 zip for Baltimore at the half the Jaguars did make it interesting midway through the third quarter with a long touchdown pass to Jamal Agnew to make it 10 to 7 uh, but from that point on Ravens would answer with a big drive from Keaton Mitchell that, that led to a short Gus Edwards touchdown run to start the fourth quarter, making it 17-7. to And then the Ravens defense putting the clamps on, they'd recover another another fumble. And their only drive that the Jaguars really got was in garbage time, Ravens would tack on a couple of field goals in the meantime for the comfortable win. So the good news for the, Ra for the Ravens, obviously, is that they get uh, another win. They start this Kind of a tough stretch at, at the end of the schedule here with a win on the road against a division leader. And I, I have kind of hemmed and hawed about some of the Ravens' previous results against some of the their lower their, their lower tier opponents. But when you get a team like the Jaguars on the road, however you can win is a good one. I know that they, they were given some opportunities by the Jaguars' mistakes, but they were given the opportunities and the, and the Ravens had to do something with them, and they did. So I feel like right now the Ravens, they're, I think not just an argument, but I think you can calmly say that right now they are the best team in the AFC at the moment we'll see how the rest of the regular season schedule plays out but as for right now if you, if you if you we were doing a whole AFC power rankings I would put the Ravens at the top of that list it isn't all good news for the Ravens however as running back Keaton Mitchell did suffer a a pretty gruesome looking season ending injury uh to his knee he was looking pretty good in his rookie season especially for uh, an undrafted rookie looked like the Ravens found a diamond in the rough there so hopefully next season he can get back to producing what he was producing and showing that top end speed but just an unfortunate way to, to have his season end like that they will square off against a fellow 11 and 3 team and the nfc's number one seed in the san francisco 49ers on monday night football on christmas so that'll be the the nfl and and football fans getting getting a, a really good game between two top teams as a, as a christmas present not too shabby uh, then you have the cleveland browns second place nine and five overall three to the 3-2 in the division after they pulled off a late comeback victory over the Chicago Bears with a final score of 20-17. to uh, They've rung out some more magic from Joe Flacco at quarterback. He had some really good chemistry with David Njoku in this one. Also hit deep passes to Marquise Goodwin and Amari Cooper that both led to scores. The Amari Cooper one was the touchdown that tied it, and then the Marquise Goodwin bomb was... Uh, that, that led to a field goal to make it a one-score game. Uh, this was in the fourth quarter after a pretty bad first three quarters for Flacco as he threw three interceptions, two of them directly leading to Bears touchdowns. One of them was a pick six, and the other one set the Bears up pretty much at the Browns' goal line. Uh, so, And the, other, the, the third interception he threw was with the Cleveland in scoring range, so that was definitely some bad swings there. So what kept him, in, kept him in the game in the meantime was the Browns' defense, like most other weeks where you had Owusu Koromoa, JOK, he was everywhere. I don't feel like I gave him uh, enough praise in my recap video for that game. The defensive line, they didn't quite reach the nine sack mark that they did in Justin Fields' first start against Cleveland, but they were certainly impactful, uh, forcing a lot of rushed throws and getting in the backfield on run plays. Uh, safeties, DeAnthony Bell, Ronnie Hickman, and Deron Harmon doing a great job of filling in for pretty much all of the injured starters where Delpit and Mikado are going to miss the rest of the season and Juan Thornhill uh, was still on the bench with injury you had Denzel Ward returning to action in this one hopefully the Browns can keep him around for the rest of the season at least uh, Cleveland is now down to one for sure healthy starter on the offensive line in right guard Wyatt Teller Joel Batonio is now day to day although Ethan Posick could also come back the starting center he could come back as well uh, they will play against Houston this week in what is a huge game 
for positioning in terms of the wild card race where you have the Browns at nine and five. You have the Texans and a lot of the rest of the AFC as well competing for playoff spots. They are at eight and six. Uh, for Houston, CJ Stroud is still in concussion protocol. If he is unable to clear that by the time the game begins, uh, it will be Case Keenum who led the Texans to a victory over the Titans last week. Uh, Case Keenum will be, will be getting a go at his former team who he was back up for when Baker Mayfield was the quarterback for Cleveland. So that could be a bit of an interesting matchup no matter who's in or out. That's definitely going to be a big game for the playoff race. And then you have the third place Cincinnati Bengals, 8-6 and six overall, still 0-4 in the division. But for the first time this season, the Bengals are out of the basement of the AFC North. And if the season ended today, they would also be in the playoffs after their 27-24 overtime win over the Minnesota Vikings. Another comeback effort to get them in the win column. Uh, late in that game, down by 7, Jake Browning throwing up a 50-50 ball that T. Higgins went up and caught. He also made a great reach for the goal line to force overtime in this one. And that was his second touchdown grab of the game. Had one earlier in the quarter to begin the comeback. Uh, then you had another touchdown drive in the fourth, ending with a Joe Mixon touchdown run on fourth and goal from the one that initially tied things up, but the Vikings would restore a seven-point lead. That did not deter the Bengals' offense with less than four minutes to go. Jake Browning marching the Cincinnati Bengals down the field, eventually leading to that T. Higgins catch that, is, that I just mentioned where he got up and grabbed it and with his outstretched hand just barely managed to get the ball over the goal line. Uh, that would force overtime. And after a, a, a really bad first drive, from the Bengals in that overtime. The Bengals defense stood tall on a tush push attempt on a fourth and one. Then a Tyler Boyd catch on a great throw from Jake Browning set the Bengals up in field goal range. They ran the ball a couple times to get the ball just a little bit closer. And McPherson was able to hit the 29 yard chip shot. And the, the Bengals playoff run, this crazy run that, that seemed like it was going to be impossible after that first Steelers game, it just keeps on going. And they have a real shot at getting their first AFC North win and some revenge over their most recent loss when they played against the Steelers as they play them again this week. Although Jamar Chase might not be able to go in this one, left the Minnesota game early and did not, he did not, he did not practice today uh, with a shoulder injury. And speaking of the Steelers, they are now last in the AFC North with a 7-7 seven seven overall record, a, a good division record of 3-1, and one, but uh, you know a new team has been sent to the basement. Steelers now fourth in the North after losing to the Colts 30-13. to 13. And it was actually uh, the Colts, putting up 30 straight points as the Steelers did go up 13-0 early in the second quarter. Things were starting to look a little bit decent with Trubisky under the helm there for a little bit. Uh, some early special teams gaff, gaffs for Indianapolis keeping them down with a missed field goal and the Steelers blocking a punt that led to uh, the Steelers' second touchdown. But after that blocked punt, that's where things started to go off the rails for Pittsburgh pretty much in a hurry where you had uh, Minshew leading a quick scoring drive to make it 13-7, Trubisky throwing a pick, and then... You know, you could settle things out at this point. A goal line stand on fourth and goal from the one did do the, the Steelers some good. The, even though you have to punt, the, the Colts, they only have 44 seconds until halftime. You should have a lead going into the locker rooms, right? Well, you have a deep completion to DJ Montgomery, a defensive pass interference, and then a touchdown pass to DJ Montgomery later. And now you're down 14-13 to 13, headed into the locker room. Not a good way to end the half for Pittsburgh. And hope of recovery in the second half was quickly dashed after forcing a Colts three and out. He had Najee Harris having his second ever lost fumble. Doesn't happen all that often to set the Colts up deep in the red zone. And then the Colts would score a touchdown on the very next play to go up 21 to 13. Game was pretty much off to the races at that point for, you know, good for Indianapolis and bad for Pittsburgh, where the offense for the Steelers went lifeless for pretty much the rest of the game. Colts offense was able to coast and settle for field goals, although they didn't even need those as the offense put up zero points in the second half. But uh, the Steelers defense was pretty much always out on the field. Didn't really have any good answers for Trey Sermon, I guess. Hey, Trey Sermon, former Ohio State running back. Good to see you. Good, good to see you still in the league and, and getting some opportunities and taking the most of them at, at times. Okay, then Trey, Ser random Trey Sermon appearance, I guess. Uh, the, the Steelers, they, they could not be in a worse place right now. Uh, they are currently sitting outside of a playoff spot after having a few weeks ago what seemed to be an advantageous schedule to build some cushion just in case losses like these happened where you have uh, the Cardinals and the Patriots lined up for you right there. But Failing to win those games lead to situations like this where now you're entering must-win territory against a white-hot Bengals team this week. Uh, Kenny Pickett, if, you, if they have any hope of coming back from this, they have to get some sort of life from whoever their quarterback ends up being. 
Uh, right now, Kenny Pickett has been a limited participant in the last couple of practices. He did get uh, second string reps behind Mason Rudolph. Oh, oh yeah, uh, Mitch Trubisky has been terrible. So Mason Rudolph will be the starter against Cincinnati if Kenny Pickett is not healed up in time for the game. I will say Mason Rudolph might still end up being as bad as Mitch Trubisky was, but I do feel like Rudolph is definitely the higher potential quarterback of the two between Trubisky and Rudolph. If you're going to have any hope of having dynamic quarterback play and winning these games, Mason Rudolph is does have that potential in him. It's just a matter of can he stop? Can he not suck enough to to have that arm strength and that and that arm and that arm talent uh, connect with those receivers? That's going to do it for me in this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far into it, feel free to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video and like to see more like it. I do these AFC North updates uh, every week. I also cover teams in Ohio. Maybe you like those videos as well. But once again, thank you for watching and I will see you at the next one.